Um, a rear guard action by Colin Adams. My secondary school was a small Christian Brothers school in the suburb of South Dublin. There were two Irish teachers there. Mr. Edward Lowry was a pugnacious, portly, postulous git of a man. Years of disillusionment and disappointment squatted on his shoulders, slowing his gait to a malevolent saunter, like a burger van on a drive-by. He had hands like the blades of spades, and under his oxter, he routinely carried a rolled-up tabloid newspaper. The blacking from the paper and the pale white dust of the chalk formed demented yin-yang symbols on his palms. These palms we saw often raised in anger, slapping desks, students, and books on tables. Every inch of him carried the threat of violence, and even though hitting students was banned in Ireland in 1982, Lowry had decided to take it under advisement. <laughs> Rumour had it that his brother was the head of the union, and so he was impossible to sack. Mr. Jack Walsh also carried a threat of violence and an air of relentless aggression, but all his violence was in his mouth. He was a tall man, and he walked with a slight stoop that made his mop of straight grey hair fall over his face. Presumably the stoop developed after years of bending over to roar into the faces of students. His Irish, his Gaelga, his Changa was bruising. To be in his lesson was to be assaulted with a salvo of improbable consonants and a payload of guttural vowels. When he laid into you, the very fabric of the alphabet seemed to tremble. We called him Jacko behind his back, out of the classroom, away from school and under our breath. He was an angry man, the anger of the idealist disappointed. The anger generated by a thousand boys who slumped and coasted their way indifferently through his lessons over an entire career. That anger loosed itself daily, calculated a cumulative interest. All his lessons and interactions with students were, de were delivered as Gwilga. There is nothing more terrifying than to be interrogated in Irish. <laughs> It is a language forged by Iron Age Celts, shot through with Viking and Norman dialects. It sounds like blood and thunder and pillage. Lowry was my first teacher in secondary school. I left primary school good at the subject. I won a weekly duish so often they let me keep it. It sits on my mantle still a cheap wooden plaque with a gold plastic rosette glued to it. But his teaching was a lazy, neglectful thing. We were directed to textbooks while he put his feet on the table and read the paper. After three years, my primary school Irish had almost eroded away. But into our senior years, there came a branching point, the leaving certificate. This was the big one, the exam that paved our way to university. Lowry knew there were students capable of attempting the higher paper, and he knew that he would be better off teaching foundation. So we were shortlisted in preparation for that step up to Jacko's class. Lowry also knew his son Zoo and understood that in the midst of chaos, there is opportunity. And so he smuggled in a ringer. A muppet he had grown to loathe. A kid as thick as a brick that he wanted shot of. The kind of snot breeding arsehole that makes a paedophile eat his own sweets. <laughs> <laughs> Dara Duffy was an arsehole. The kind who distracted people from it, from it, the kind who, 
the kind who distracted people from his own insecurities by harpooning the insecurities of others. There was no anxiety, impediment or imperfection Duffy would not pick up on. To be fair, it was kind of a gift. He could pinpoint the one thing you didn't want anyone to see and expose it to ridicule like a shopkeeper with a dodgy tenor. Duffy was the reason we called Stephen Murphy tampon. The reason Seamus O'Neill had eyebrows whispered at him every time he walked down the corridor. <laughs> and why singing the chorus of What is Love by Hathaway would reduce Donald O'Clark to tears. <laughs> so we entered Jacko's class and he lined us up. We stood facing his class, backs to the blackboard. They sat smug. They were safe today. Fresh meat had wandered in. Bemused Christians at a Roman public holiday. They were going to sit back and enjoy the entertainment. He went to each of us in turn, testing our language with simple conversational questions. What we did over half term, hobbies, favorite sports, where we live, the usual stuff really. But asked with such piercing intensity, you think the fate of nations rested on our responses. At the end of the line was Dara Duffy. Like Lowry, Duffy instinctively understood Sun Tzu. Chaos presented opportunities for mischief, hurt, disorder, distraction and disruption. Or at least keep him out of lessons for the odd 20 minutes. And so he readied his face. The right balance of disdain and smirk. Nothing that, be, nothing that could be accused of disrespect but clearly not respectful either. It fortified him against any chance some learning might sneak in. Teacher and student alike lived in fear of Duffy's toxic, infectious lethargy and his unerring ability to say the unsayable. And so there he stood, the dark fader of dickheads. <laughs> A carefully constructed artifice of studied disdain on his features. His jaw became slacker, his eyes more vacant, his spine looser. The vertebrae awash in loopy cartilage. Every sinew was focused on paying as little as attention as possible. If he paid less attention to the world around him at that point, he might just have forgotten to breathe. But there is a cost to, some, to such concentrated inattention. He wasn't watching Jacko pace the line. He didn't measure the depth of the silence or the temperature of the room. And as Jacko interrogated each individual, he realized too late they weren't waiting to see what he would do. They were waiting for Jacko waiting to see what the raptor would do with the cuckoo in his nest. In fairness, Duffy didn't flinch. He'd taken down bigger before. His inability to master Pythagoras' theorem had once made his maths teacher crack a filling. And, <laughs> <laughs> and Dooley had been ex-army. His ignorance held real power. <laughs> they couldn't force him to learn anything. <laughs> Duffy marshalled the two words in his Irish vocabulary like the last Spartans at Thermopylae. Nihigum. This means, I don't know. <laughs> of course, what Duffy didn't realise was that Jacko had no interest in educating him. His intention was the complete and systematic annihilation of Duffy's self-esteem. He recognised Duffy as Lowry's creature, a product of everything he sheltered his guttering flame against and he intended to destroy him. And then, like an angry, mournful Achilles, 
drag his body round the walls of Troy in a chariot of his righteousness. Jacko started easy. Call will to it, O'Connor. Where do you live? This was baby stuff. Every primary school kid could answer this one. Duffy flourished his knee higgum. This garnered a snigger, and Duffy recognized it. It was his currency, but the timing was off. Could it have been directed at him? He needed to speak, say something, anything. He didn't want them to think he was a complete tool. His stupidity needed to look deliberate or else all was lost. He trawled his memory for some Irish, any Irish. Surely he'd picked some up during those six weeks at the Quail Tart. And then, like a swimmer borne away on the tide, he was back there on the shores of the sunny southeast. Back there with buxom, freckled, grainne O'Hanlon, the shopkeeper's daughter. Back there on that dusky evening when he let her gently finger his arsehole under the pier at Woodstown Strand. <laughs> Lost in his reverie. <laughs> He missed the intense appraisal Jacko was giving him. He missed the second snigger that was most definitely aimed at him. And most importantly, he missed the hint of a wolfish grin that flitted across the teacher's face. Duffy came too and Jacko was asking him what he'd been doing over half term at Squelga. Confronted by Duffy's noxious, leering gob, he mimed knocking on his head and boomed in his face. It took Duffy a second longer to respond. Niegum, more sniggers. Asquelga, Jacko asked him how old he was. Niegum, he asked him his name. Niegum, he asked him if he knew how to use the toilet. Niegum, he asked him what he did know. Niegum. It was open laughter now, and the whispers of a hardening knot of mockery. To every question, Duffy gave the same answer. But he was not enjoying the frustration of the teacher. He was feeling the deep, intense shame of someone who's been humiliated, but is not sure how. And you could see Jacko grow malevolent, you could see Jacko grow more malevolent with each question. Duffy felt the full fury of a man who had spent 20 years teaching his kids a subject that they had hated. It was a massacre. He peeled away Duffy's mask like old dry wallpaper. Duffy began to sweat and grow red in the face. This was what he'd always feared, to be pinioned against a wall, his ignorance exposed to ridicule in front of everyone. And to not even understand the insult, was the worst humiliation of all. The questions and the laughter continued. He asked Duffy about his family, his house, and then onto basic vocabulary. He pointed at the chair and asked him what it was. Duffy was transfixed. Any hope of a correct answer was gone. Jacko's rage built to a crescendo, ranting now. Still Asquelga, his massive hands articulating wildly, wringing imaginary necks, pommeling imaginary faces. In the end, he bellowed so loud the pains trembled in their frames. Duffy didn't need a translator to know he'd been kicked out. He departed with all available haste and from my position at the top of the row, I could see him through the window of the classroom stood out in the corridor. I watched as he loose, loosened his tie and wiped the sweat from his forehead with the cuff of his sweater. And just for a moment, I swear, his expression was of the purest agony, like the mask from a Greek tragedy, an expression of pure anguish. 
but like a mask, it was gone as easy as taking it off. He performed a quick exploration of his nasal cavity and went into Lowry's class. He sought to reposition. It's a week later when I see Duffy. It's Dolan's RE lesson. Mr. Dolan has a pronounced stutter which is exacerbated when he's tired or stressed. And today Duffy has spontaneously developed a speech impediment too. He is playing to the crowd, volunteering to answer a question and then stuttering his answer. Dolan is shrinking by the second. He can't tell Duffy off because to do so would admit his impediment and his weakness. Duffy's face is a snarling rictus of malevolent joy as his false starts seem to go on forever and the weight is excruciating. We laugh, but secretly we all wish he would stop. But then it happens. Floating down from the back row of the class, an exaggerated, <laughs> and we laugh. Duffy stops and reddens. His false starts are real now, and we all laugh again. You can see his face is trying to reassemble the mask, reassert his authority but it's gone. Desperate, he tries to retreat in his mind to his happy place, but even the dunes of Woodstown are empty now. Even Grania has left him. <laughs> Gone back to our house to scrub our hands with imperial leather. <laughs> Duffy lets his arm fall to his side, and without looking up, mutters, I don't know. Thank you.